Okay, so now we're in for a real treat, because uh, Ian Rogers might just be the coolest luxury executive I've ever met. He is a serial entrepreneur, having built and sold several companies to the likes of AOL, Yahoo, and most recently Apple, which acquired uh, a, mu a business he helped to build, which is Beats Music, in 2014. Ian stayed on at Apple uh, until LVMH surprised everyone and brought Ian in to transform the group's digital culture and thinking. And about a year ago, Ian and I began a dialogue on what the fashion industry can learn from music and technology. And with this lens, I felt I left each conversation feeling enlightened and excited about the future of fashion and technology. And I'm really, really delighted to bring Ian Rogers to the Voices stage. Yeah. It was embarrassing. <laughs> It's true. I mean, you, um, you don't, you know, I, I, I have spent some time in the, the halls of LVMH. Um, this we know. Yeah. And, you know, there's, not a, uh, there's no one like you that walks around in those halls in Paris on Avenue Montaigne. And I'm, and, you know, I'm just curious. It's been, what, about a year now? Yeah, a year in September. So with, with, with a year's perspective, or just over a year's perspective, you know, what are your initial reflections? This is an industry that's new to you. You come from the music industry. You come yeah. from the technology industry. What are your reflections? Well, I think, you know, it, what I've always been interested in personally is how the internet has changed culture. I come from a small town in Indiana, and, you know, culture for me growing up was limited to what's on the FM, what's on television, what's at the magazine rack. And as that, that kid that was into skateboarding and punk rock and fanzines, like the internet made immediate sense to me. I, I feel like for anyone that ever made a, a fanzine with a marker, you know, the internet made perfect sense day one because it, it just was distribution of culture. Um, so in, in what's, what's really happened and what I always liked in music was the way that, that the internet is changing culture. And I think that fundamentally the fashion business is also, a, it's a culture business, right? We sell culture as a prerequisite to selling product. If you don't buy the culture of the brand, you're not gonna buy a $3,000 handbag, right? It's, um, you're, you're buying into the, what, what that communicates culturally to the, to the, to the cultural value. Um, at, at the same time, it doesn't suffer from the same fundamental value loss that the music or, or media business generally has because you can't take the entire product catalog of a fashion house and put it on a thumb drive and hand it to a friend, um, which is the world that, that we all lived through um, in, the, in the music business. So you have, you have these products that are made you know, traditionally um, and I think that, that there's more value to handmade and craftsmanship than ever in a quote-unquote digital world. Um, but you sell culture as a prerequisite to selling those products, and the way that culture is transmitted has fundamentally changed mm -hmm. because of the internet. So I think that's kind of, um, you know, I feel like since I've, I've arrived at LVMH, I've been kind of untangling knots. You know, you kind of go down a pathway, and you're like, what, what is this, and why is this? And, I want to try to understand that, and, um, but I think that the, the great thing for me is that, it, that underneath there are still those same lessons that we learned in music about the way culture has changed. Yeah. So let's talk about the music industry. I think this came up yesterday as well. Um, you know, as an industry, music was very slow to respond. And, you know, as you said, that product could be digitized really yeah. easily. Yeah. And the music industry kind of sat back and watched as this disruption was happening. They did, they did worse than that, actually. Yeah. It was, they were in full-on denial. Right, you denial. Know, the, the you know, lawsuits and, you know. Yeah, I mean, the first time I tried to license music in the music business was 1999. Um, and they said, first of all, what are you talking about? We've never even heard of that before. Even though we had a community of 30 million people who wanted the product in this format, they were like, what? That's a fad, right? Mm. And then secondly, they said, no, that'll never happen. We're gonna sell CDs forever. Um, so I think that there is a parallel in that. Watching an industry go from denial to growth, you know, last year was the first year that the music business 
grew a little bit again, and it's on, it's on the, because they've finally hit bottom, and then the streaming businesses are getting to a critical mass to where the business is, is growing a bit again. Um, but the, the recorded music business lost nearly 50% of its value over those years. So there's a, there's a high price to pay for, um, you know, not serving the customer the way they want to be served. So when you look at the fashion industry now and the luxury industry more widely, because obviously LVMH is more than just mm -hmm. fashion, I mean, do you feel like in a way we're in the same kind of state of denial as the music industry was back then? Because although a physical luxury product can't be digitized, mm -hmm. um, the, you know, for, a, for an industry that's built on communicating and, and, and kind of giving out this idea of a dream, which you know, is something else that also came up yesterday, digital technology, digital media, the internet, social media, all of these are tools for communicating that dream and then also interacting with the consumer like we heard in the retail panel. Mm -hmm. you know, where, do you, where do you grade the industry? I know it's hard to make an overall generalization because people are at different levels, but how do you compare where we're at compared to where the music industry was at when that disruption happened? Well, I think that because the product can't be digi digitalized, um, there's a lot more, there's an inherent protection. And I think that, uh, again, I, I guess I would take it from this angle. We're, this is really not about digital. We keep, we keep talking about digital, and it's, uh, that part is really foreign to me, right? We never talked about digital, right, when I was at Apple. It was just the world. It's like yeah. talking about oxygen yeah. all the time, like, yeah. wow. Um, and, and so it, I think that a lot of what, um, is happening right now is th there, there's a technological part that people have been scared of. Um, but it's, at, you know, I feel like a lot of what my job is is to con convince people this is not a technological revolution, it's a cultural revolution. And it's not actually not about digital, it's about something much more specific, which is the internet. And the internet has changed the way that human beings are connected. So I, I feel like, you know, you have really a cultural revolution with an industry that understands culture you know, that's, that's, what, that's what they do. So as soon as we can, you know, take away this, this, um, this title of digital and just it's look at... It's in your title, by the way. Exactly. It's like, I, what did um, Scott Galloway called me the, the chief electricity officer, <laughs> right? Which is, it, and it is, it is like that, you know, yeah. it's because, it, and really it's true that my job actually is to get digital out and put it in all the places that it needs to be. And in many ways, in the organizations, when you, when you, um, you know, when you, when you sort of, get rid of the digital silo and make sure that digital is a part of communications, is a part of retail, that's when, it, that's when the companies do well, right? So um, I think that, uh, you know, the, the, the challenge here, I, wait, I lost thread of the, what was the original question? Well, the, well, we'll, we'll move on because I think you answered it. <laughs> I think you answered it. So as, as, you, as you think about the luxury industry and companies like LVMH, you know, how, how do you think we should be preparing for this future? Not digital future, but the future, which, of which technology is clearly playing a more and more important role. Well, I, I, think, that, I, th I think that, again, these are, these are cultural businesses, right? So um, you have to, you, there's, there's sort of, I would say there's two separate sides, right? I think people get tangled up in the conversation when they, when they try to talk about um, you know, how do we digitalize the business? And, and really, there's, there's these two things that, that, um, that all of the businesses do. One is communicate the, the image of the brand, right? And again, because the way that we communicate has changed fundamentally, you have to just, you have to do that through the channels that, that the customers want. And the other is, how do you serve the customers um, from an experience and a product perspective? Um, and you know, I think that, that, that really the, the luxury business is in a great position relative to where the world's going. This was my personal interest in, in coming to this space because, you know, like I said, I've always been interested in how the internet has changed culture. And those fundamental changes from my point of view are it's, it's moving the world from mass markets to niche markets, right? Um, to borrow from Jeff Jarvis, who wrote What Would Google Do uh, a long time ago. And 
and what do you, what do you have in the, in the luxury business? It's actually a mass of niches, right? We're, we're, um, because all of these brands have really strong identities, um, and, and those identities are, by definition, you know, smaller than, than mass brands, Walmart, Gap, uh, whatever. The other is that because consumers have unlimited choice, and the customer voice is so loud, um, we're moving you know, from a world where marketing has this uh, hyper-efficiency to a world where quality has hyper-efficiency. So I look at a... What at do a, you mean by that? What I mean is, you know, there was, I actually um, borrowed this, Umer Hawk um, wrote this thing back in 2004 called the blockbuster versus the snowball. And it really shaped my, my thinking on this. And his premise was that it's basically this. If we're making Pirates of the Caribbean 12, right? You know, we're not trying to make Citizen Kane. We're trying to get people to go to theater A instead of theater B, right? Because right? there's limited distribution. So if we have an extra $2 million, do we spend it on making the movie better or on putting Johnny Depp's face on the cups at Burger King? Right? Yeah. You spend it on marketing, because in a world with limited distribution, marketing is hyper-efficient. At a certain point, you get diminishing returns on quality. But online, it's exactly the opposite. And you see it in the media world. Right? Look, at, look at the whether it's um, House of Cards, or Transparent, or Stranger Things. You know, did, were, are these shows successful because of their incredible marketing campaigns? No, they're successful because they're good. And when people saw them, they told five people, you got to see this. And so there is the quality hyper-efficiency. That's a snowball. That's a, that's a snowball. And that's the quality hyper-efficiency. And at a certain point, you get diminishing returns on marketing because you, it's impossible to reach everyone, right? I mean, right. there is, we don't, the messages don't, invade our lives in the same way that we did when we sat in front of a TV all day, every day, right? So again, coming back, my, my argument is, you know, you, you ask the question, um, how do you prepare for the future? I would argue that, that the wind is blowing in the right direction and you just need to raise the sails. Because I think when I look at a group like LVMH, I see a mass of niches, okay? So that's want, check. And I also see companies that are genuinely concerned about quality and metier. And I mean, you know, that's what I love about the company. Like, Mr. Arnaud cares deeply about, the, about the, the creativity and the craftsmanship. And that, that works from a business standpoint because quality is hyper-efficient. So I, I think that luxury brands are, um, are well-placed when, uh, when it comes to this kind of, um, you know, we would say the digital world, but what I would say, the way the internet has changed culture. The interesting thing about the mass niche concept is that it also presents new opportunities for really small businesses because, you know, theoretically you can reach the same audience going through the same pipes, no matter if you're like a big company or a small company. I guess, you know, big companies can pay for distribution on the internet, but as you say, good content travels. Like, you know, LVMH is a group with, you know, a mixture of like massive houses that have like unlimited marketing budgets or seemingly unlimited marketing budgets and then smaller yeah. Smaller brands, like how do you, how do you advise a company that's you know a big global brand versus one of the kind of emerging emerging brands in the group? I mean, it's you're right, and it's a great time to be small, right? I mean, you're an ex example of that. You've you know you've internet native brand, and I mean, look what you've look what you've been able to build, and it and it'll keep it'll keep building. So it's a it's a great time to to start and make that that snowball happen. Um, and I think that, that the bigger brands are realizing that, that they need to act small um, in a lot of ways. And, and you have to, from a marketing perspective, you really test and learn. You have to do much more quickly. You're not necessarily looking at how much did I spend last holiday season, now how much am I going to spend this holiday season. You're, um, you know, you're actually you know, creating content, you're making that content specific for the channel, different from on Facebook than from Instagram. You put that out organically. You look at the um, at, at at how that lands on the audience, and then you you know put marketing spend behind it if it if it works, right? So it's a much um, tighter loop, um, I think, than it used to be. And big companies uh, have to act that way too. The really great thing in the group is that is the perfumes and cosmetics side of the business, from Sephora to Makeup Forever and Benefit Cosmetics. Particularly, makeup is living in the future. Right? I would say everybody should pay attention to what's happening in, in the world of makeup because um, it, it is what's happening to them has, will happen to all of us you know, in over, what ways? over time. So tell us what you mean. You're seeing um, you know, very small independent brands grab an inordinate 
piece of the, of the pie. The growth is coming from um, either niche or, in, or independent brands in the industry, and, and they're doing a lot with influencers and, uh, and organic content. And, and, the, and the kind of the, the, um, the battlefield, if you will, is there um, as much or more as it is on the media side, which is where it used to be. Now that there's a big spectrum between you know, makeup, cosmetics, and perfume, Perfume doesn't, you know, isn't uh, quite as communicative, easily communicated on Instagram, right? right. But, um, but I think for fashion, you know, you see, you certainly see the same dynamic as, as makeup. Yeah. So what's been the hardest thing? Because, you know, it, I find it incredible, actually, because you have such a, like, refreshing mindset, and it's so different from... You know, I get to meet a lot of luxury executives, you know, and, and as part of my job. And over the years, I've just found there's just so much resistance to, to, to like, thinking differently. But how, how, have, how have you found it personally operating in this industry where you're kind of an outsider? Yeah. I mean, I, I've really enjoyed it, to be honest with you. Yeah. And I think maybe it's, I, I like the challenge, um, but everybody has been great. You know, there, there, there's really so many smart people. It, it's, I haven't experienced, um, at least uh, to my face, uh, you know, the, the, real, the real resistance. Um, and I think that, that, you know, there's a lot of uh, openness. Maybe I'm glad I wasn't here four years ago, right? Yeah. And so right now, people are really anxious to, to make a transformation happen and the conversation center on what should we do, not should we do it or not, right? right? Um, which, is, uh, which is great. Um, so I, I think, you know, it's definitely different culturally, right? Moving from LA to Paris and... And using the word métier. Using the word métier. And to, maison. I'm obsessed with, with, um, with, using, with choosing the right words in a business where I don't speak the language. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm definitely, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know. You should ask them how they feel about me. I will. I will one day. <laughs> I, that might not be so positive. I don't I'm know. Sure it's, I'm sure it's very <laughs> positive. Last question is, okay, so you've got in front of you this kind of incredible group of decision makers, influencers, movers and shakers in the fashion industry. You know, what's your one bit of advice? Because we're all trying to make sense of this rapid technological change that we're living in. And we are in a, in a world or in an industry with physical products, but you know, technology is all around us, it's everywhere. So what's your advice for people as they, as they try to cope with, embrace, and seize the change? Wow, I mean, I, I think if, if I could you know, wave a magic wand and get people to the other side of the transformation faster so that what happened in music with that value loss doesn't happen here, um, you know, I, I think practically speaking, I would, I'd really focus on the organizations in the businesses and, um, and get digital inside of the organizations as quickly as possible instead of having it be kind of a separate, uh, a separate piece. And, and really, I think on a practical level, um, you know, again, I'm obsessed with the words, so translate it however you want, but stop using the word digital. It, it doesn't mean anything. Right? Um, right, you know, it's like the watch I had in second grade that played Pac-Man. You know, I mean, what we're talking about is so so replace digital with the word internet, wherever you use it, because then you start to talk about this thing that connects people, and that's what's really happening and what's really causing the the, the change, and you're contextualizing it, it properly then, and then in in many places use the word innovation. Where you, where you would have talked about digital. Those are, I think, the two things you want to think about is how is the internet changing culture? And then what do we do? How do we innovate to, do, to get to the next place? Um, so I think if you can get the organizations, get the word digital out of your organization um, and, and really think about how the internet is changing culture, then this is a, this is a super smart industry that, that understands culture maybe better than any other. So and I think people get on the right path. So maybe your title should be Chief Innovation Officer. I would take it. Okay. All right. Thanks, Ian. <laughs> Thanks.